Hey everybody, my name is Guillermo Jacinto. I'm a directing animator at Pixar. And today we're going to talk about the process that we went through to create these skeletons on Coco. Before we could design an appealing skeleton, we needed to do our research and really study the real anatomy of real skeletons. As we all know, skeletons can be pretty creepy. And so early on, the art department started exploring some ideas on how we could make these skeletons more appealing. So by stylizing the shapes of the bones and the proportions of the, their bodies, and by using clothing to add personality and highlight their boniness, they were able to create some really appealing designs. So all this work is done by the amazing art team on Coco, led by Harley Jessup and Danny Arriaga. They provided these beautiful designs that were really inspirational for, for everybody, for the whole team. Here you can see some early facial expression sketches, just exploring the expression ranges for the skeletons. And some early exploration on how the different parts of the skull might animate. So you can see back and forth here how the brows could move and whether we needed skeleton lips or not. This is an early animation test that I did to see if we could convey the full range of expressions that our director, Lee Unkrich, was after. So he really wanted to make sure that we could uh, create these rich characters that the audience could really connect with. And this test was really important just to see if the eyes were giving us that full range of expressions that we were after. All the character designers were able to take a stab at making sculpts to really explore the style and the shape language of the film and the look and feel of the characters. And by painting over these pictures of the sculpts, they were really able to experiment with a lot of different ideas, trying out you know, multiple things such as eyes, no eyes, do we need hair, no hair, eyelashes, no eyelashes. There were so many big questions that we didn't know uh, that we didn't have answers for at the, at the very beginning. Teeth, no teeth, and much more. We were also experimenting with face paint. You know, face paint is so common during the celebrations of Dia de Muertos. And they're so beautiful and colorful, and we just wanted to make sure that we highlighted them in the movie and made it really beautiful and fun. Here's another early animation test of a skeleton that we did to explore character and acting. And this is also one of the first tests that we saw the shading uh, with the face paint on the skeletons. And so we just were wondering if those lines on the face were going to be distracting, if they were going to enhance the performance. So this test was really powerful for, for us to kind of get some of those questions answered. So when it comes to animating the skeletons, we've never, you know, we've never animated skeletons at Pixar before. And there were a lot of challenges that we'd never dealt with um, before. We knew that we wanted the skeletons to have a very wide emotional range. And we wanted to stay away from scary and keeping, keeping them fun. So in order to keep them believable, we had to come up with these guidelines to respect their structure and their design. Because they don't have any muscles holding their bones together, we saw all these opportunities to do something really fun and unique to this world. So we got our first rig, and we started with a simple walk cycle, like we usually do with our characters. And so without muscles, like, how does the skeleton propel itself when it's in motion? You know, how do we make it engaging and funny? Their bodies are lighter compared to the living characters. So we asked ourselves, how much can we break away from these animation principles when it comes to weight and balance? What holds these bones together, and how far can they move independently from each other? We were pretty excited about these crazy performance possibilities. Here you can see a wedge test of a run cycle showing varying degrees of how loose we could treat their parts. We also knew that we wanted to contrast the physicality between the dead world and the living world. So we looked for inspiration on how the skeletons might move. At the beginning stages of explorations, we watched some videos of puppets. And we played around with the idea of incorporating this kind of puppety look to them by really separating the chest from the hips. And we were really pr playing with how far we can go until it's just not believable anymore. We did a few tests exploring how Hector might move. And to really find Hector's walk, we were inspired by Ratso who was played by Dustin Hoffman in Midnight Cowboy. He had a limp that really symbolized his brokenness as a character, and the animators really liked that as a detail for Hector. You know, some of these tests went too far, where it looked like he had a disease. <laughs> but Lee really helped guide us to a walk that we were all really happy with. When it comes to style, animation tests like this helped 
find the right physicality for our skeletons. You know, how stylized do we want to go? These really help define the rules of our animation. These animators were pushing the rig so much that we found that we were constantly needing new controls to achieve the performance that we were after. Lee really enjoyed seeing these tests early on, and they really helped define the tone of the dead world and increase the physical comedy of the movie. The face is a big part of our acting performance in any of our movies, and being able to show a wide range of emotions in the skeleton faces was one of our biggest challenges. We wanted to bring out the appeal for the skull, but still embrace the skull for what it is. We normally stay really true to the materials for our characters, but we chose to break that rule in a couple of the places of the face to make sure that the audience could really connect with the emotions. The thought process of our character really tends to happen in the eyes, so we decided to have eyeballs with eyelids, and we shaped the eye sockets, uh, posing them like eyebrows. Skeletons obviously don't have tongues, and we stay true to that. We found that we were able to articulate dialogue without needing a tongue. And we decided to move away from keeping a separate jawbone structure and chose to give, to give them skeleton lips to have that full range of expressions available to us. We came up with a design language for the shapes, and we added these angles and edges to the lips and the corners of the mouth to really suggest rigid bones there were so many different rules to pose the mouth angles. I think a lot of animators really regretted not paying attention to geometry class in high school. So Lee and Adrian's original pitch for these characters included having a really wide emotional range of expressions, having fun, unique personalities, pushing the style of animation to be really stylized, and show a range of looseness in the bones to represent how well they're remembered in the living world. And we're really happy with how we're able to bring it all together in, in the animation. Another aspect of the skeletons that we really wanted to highlight was the looseness of their bones. So that meant that we had to find a way to animate all these individual bones for hundreds of characters. And since we had so many skeletons in this movie, we wanted to find a way to automate this process. So as a starting point, you can see how stiff the rib cage looks. So we asked our friends in Global Tech, Don Schmidt and JD Northrup, to help us. They developed a system that could simulate loose bones reacting to the character's movements. And the work that they did saved animators countless hours animating all this stuff by hand. So in the world of Coco, we have this idea that there is this invisible force that holds the bones together. And the strength of that force is determined by how well remembered these characters are in the living world. So we had a huge group of characters ranging from very loose type of motion to very rigid. And we had to set up these five preset configurations that animators could just apply to their characters before running the simulation. And after running the sim, you get something that looked like this. The, the movement was often too broad, but we found that it was easier to tone things down than to amp things up. And in order to tweak the movement, we had these post-simulation controls that acted as dials for different parts of the body. So if the simulation came back too loose, animators could easily dial down the overall movement or just bump it up. And we ended up breaking up the controls into three regions, the vertebrae, the ribs, and the sternum. And after quickly adjusting the mode movement, you'd end up with something like this. And here you can see the before and after side by side. The extra looseness of the rib cage and the spine really helped add some specificity to the skeleton's movements. And once animators were happy with the amount of movement on their bones, we could run the cloth simulation. You know, most of the bone movement was covered up, but you can still feel the looseness of the bones through the garments. The sim department set up a system that allowed animators to run simulations really fast and accurately locally. And it was a really great way for us to see how the acting and the movement was being affected by the shapes of the garments. So for instance, you could really run a sim on a character who's wearing a skirt and then decide whether or not to invest time polishing the movement of the legs because you might not see it at all. So I'm not a tailor or a simulation artist, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of interesting challenges that that team had on Coco. So the following clips represent the work of Christine Wagoner, Emron Grover, and the whole tailoring and simulation team at Pixar. This is Hector's costume. 
you know, Pixar's had years of experience making digital clothing, but we've never clothed uh, skeletons before. And we knew that Hector would be one of the most difficult ones because he shows so much bone. So it's just very difficult to cheat. So how do we make cloth drape over bones? There are many gaps and holes for the cloth to fall into and get stuck. But Lee was always asking us to embrace the skeletonness. Lee really wanted to see the definition of the bones that was under the clothing. So a collision body was created, which contained a sealed up rib cage, but we kept the rib separation to really embrace the skeleton, but we fused the radius and the ulna and the tibia and fibula on the legs. And besides the collision issues, there were still a lot of skeleton specific problems that we needed to solve, like the floating kneecaps or the gaps between the bones. So if you take a look at Hector's knee on the right, you can see the cloth getting bunched up in there. The solution was to fuse the joint gaps with cloth, which prevented the cloth from falling in there and getting stuck. So as the bones separated, the cloth stretched and didn't allow the pants or the sleeves to fall into the gaps. And for Imelda and other characters, force fields were used, and they're basically spheres that contain wind that are thus blowing outwards. And those are useful underneath dresses because we don't need as much shape control. Design-wise, it was sometimes difficult to create volume that's formed by muscles. So soft pillows were used to fill spaces to create this invisible volume. And those are really useful to create that space without distracting from that boniness that Lee Unkrich was wanting to see. Also, the Sim team developed a new technology that allowed us animators to interact with the cloth, and those were called sim grabs. So if a specific acting choice required the character to interact with their own cloth, we could easily just add a sim grab to our shot. Interacting with cloth is usually very difficult to do, so these new sim grabs allowed animators to think more freely about their acting choices. So that's all I have. That was a quick overview of how we brought these skeletons to life. We're very proud of how Cocoa turned out, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you so much.